This video is supported by Squarespace. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and along with a bunch of Starship development updates, this has been a huge week. We had the always magical and fiery Delta IV Heavy with the NROL-91 mission. A little bittersweet though, and you'll see why. We had the amazing DART mission successfully smashing into Dimorphos in one of the most spectacular displays of deep space action to date. NASA's Artemis I saga continues with yet another rollback of the SLS, but I'm sure you'll forgive them when you see why. Firefly just made it to orbit in their second ever attempt. Then we have Rocket Lab's Neutron update, Ariane Space's smart upper stage, and a bunch more. Let's get started. Firstly, for Starship news this week, we'll start over at the relatively new Macy site where groundbreaking work is occurring for a future testing facility. Thanks to the recent drone flight of the facility by RGV Aerial Photography, we can see that this is rapidly becoming a new location for tank testing operations. A big advantage of using Macy's here is that they won't need to close Highway 4 during the testing of these smaller prototypes. This is all private access too, so this problem doesn't exist here. Certainly Certainly a bonus considering that SpaceX do have limited road closures around Starbase. It's also going to allow SpaceX to continue that development cycle without affecting the launch operations. It looked like they were planning on starting testing pretty soon with the presence of these two test tanks which were moved to the new facility last week. One of those being the B7.1 test tank which has had multiple tests already including cryo tests and a bunch of tests on the can crusher. With the lack of a can crusher at the Macy site here, it's going to be intriguing to see what tests are performed next. The other test tank is where things get interesting. The E-Dome test tank using the new flatter domes had not been tested up until this point as far as we know. Additionally, deliveries of nitrogen had already begun for the two horizontal test tanks, so we were sure that they were preparing for something. Now, unfortunately, of course, for all of us watching the Starbase operations so closely, we are quite unlikely to see live streaming cameras following these tests. But but in this case, thanks to Lab Padre, we were able to witness this first bout of testing and SpaceX were not messing around, blowing the top off the E-Dome just moments after the camera panned over to it. Okay, so let's take the short drive over to Starbase. The actual launch site was pretty quiet this week in terms of any testing action. Instead, as shown beautifully by NASA Spaceflight, the orbital launch mount has been an absolute hive of activity this week, with workers all over it installing a load of shielding and upgrades. As shown here by Ryan and Zach, a lot of plate work is going in to stop explosions spreading through the mount in various areas. That is a critical upgrade for sure. Other than that, just in the past day, Ship 24 was removed from the suborbital launch platform and moved over near the tower. At the time of rendering this, it wasn't clear if they were heading back to the production site or if they planned to do some testing right here. The production facility was busy as always. On Monday, Booster 9's thrust section was moved into the mega bay ahead of stacking with the rest of the liquid oxygen tank. Interestingly, if we compare this thrust section to that of Booster 7 and Booster 8, we can see that SpaceX's taken the time to pre-assemble more of the components before stacking. The autogenous pressurization lines are here, and the first of the vertical COPV stacks. Also clearly visible is the liquid oxygen header tank to supply the oxygen needed for landing. This time though, with the crew walkway on top, I'd say this is most likely to aid with the welding of the downcomer soon after stacking. I think a big notable absence is the two hydraulic power units, or HPUs. We believe that in the past, these were only used for the gimbling of the inner Raptor engines. Now, Elon Musk indicated in Tim Dodd's tour that one goal down the line for Raptor 2 was to move to electric thrust vector control instead of the currently used hydraulic systems. The electric thrust vector control would get the required power coming from the battery systems that should largely already be on board. Even if they need to expand it, it should be trivial to do that anyway. It's a great move to simultaneously decrease the complexity of the booster as well as lower the dry mass. Perhaps with this move to electric gimbling on the booster, we can expect a similar move on the ship, which I think can actually already be happening with Ship 26. 
So once in the mega bay, the teams didn't waste any time and swiftly Booster 9's liquid oxygen tank was finished. I wouldn't be too surprised if SpaceX will focus on completing all the systems on the oxygen tank before they fully stack Booster 9. A major advantage is that they won't need a bridge crane permanently hooked up when the oxygen tank isn't pressurized. All of the COPV assembly and the work on the Raptor explosion containment system would be a lot simpler at this point. A new ship thrust section test article was moved from the dome yard to the Sanchez site on Monday. That was then lifted up onto the can crusher, with the cap being lifted up a few days later. There was even some new parts added here that look to be able to stress test the aft flaps during testing. To me, it looks like they will be testing the forces on the unpressurized skirt area of a ship. This barrel here doesn't have a dome inside it or anything, so we'll be watching this one closely. Speaking of a barrel with nothing inside of it, this week the payload bay barrel for Ship 26 moved into the high bay. This barrel doesn't have a Starlink PEZ dispenser, and in fact it doesn't even have a payload bay door cutout. It's looking more and more likely that Ship 26 is also going to be expended. Perhaps SpaceX is preparing this ship for transportation towards the Cape. That doesn't indicate the end of the Starlink PEZ dispenser though. Let's take another look at the Starlink satellite dispenser, most likely for a future ship here. The super detailed pictures last week made by Starship Gazer were a real treasure trove. Just look at the insane amount of detail showing all of the wiring, piping, and the construction of the dispenser itself. Now these are not just useful for us to peer at, but also the 3D artists who quickly got to work fully analyzing the entire system pixel by pixel to get a very good understanding of it all. Take this awesome render by Chameleon Circuit for example, showing a speculative view of how SpaceX will be able to load and unload the satellites with the dispenser. The insights we've gained from these pictures is just staggering. Of course, none of this detail would be possible without the great source shots such as those by Starship Gazer. And if you are helping support him there, that is amazing of you. The time and effort that it takes to get this material is significant, so appreciate you being able to help him out on Patreon there. Likewise, I appreciate you listening to me ramble on about space stuff here on the channel. Remember, I'm changing it up next weekend with a deep dive video on artificial gravity options that Starship can help provide. I can't wait to see what you think of that one. It has been a roller coaster ride creating this. Super interesting, so click all those YouTube things that you need to press these days to make sure that you are notified. In a surprise announcement, NASA and SpaceX signed an unfunded Space Act agreement late this week to study the concept of a Polaris program mission with Crew Dragon heading out to rescue the Hubble Space Telescope. The idea is to use Dragon to push the incredible telescope into a higher orbit, extending its life greatly, and I might add, at no cost to the government. Well, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Now, there are a bunch of technical questions to study, of course, and there is no guarantee that this will actually be feasible. However, the fact that SpaceX and Jared are working with NASA to determine if they can safely rendezvous, dock, and push it up to a stable orbit, well, it's a pretty amazing idea. Now, a few short hours after last week's episode, we saw the very final Delta IV Heavy launch from the West Coast. I don't know about you, but even while excitedly watching this launch, I couldn't help but feel just a little sad that we'll never quite see this same sight again from this launch site. This is certainly one of my favorite rockets, this one. The heavy lift launch vehicle with the second highest payload capacity, second only to SpaceX's Falcon Heavy. We can, however, still look forward to the remaining two missions on Delta IV Heavy to be flown out of the Cape next year and in 2024. After that, it is replaced by ULA's Vulcan rocket. Now, this spectacular launch was the NROL-91 mission. In this one, United Launch Alliance was hurling a classified payload into orbit here for the National Reconnaissance Office. It was a beautiful afternoon liftoff here from the picturesque Space Launch Complex 6 at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. That ignition sequence is always a real treat too, with flames licking up the sides of the booster. Perfectly normal and expected, and freaking spectacular. This burns off that excess hydrogen right before 
before igniting the starboard engine, followed by the center and the port booster. And with that, it was away, roaring uphill from the west coast one last time. Great vision here, punching through Max Q before the breathtaking sequence of events, including that booster separation. Now, during the live stream, there was a slight interruption in the feed at booster engine cutoff, missing the first and second stage separation. But still, a nice view of the nozzle extending here prior to the upper stage engine ignition. Sadly, with that, the mission coverage ended on request of the NRO, with successful payload deployment to follow. Right, the news of this week I think was the DART mission. Think back to last year when SpaceX's Falcon 9 launched NASA's double asteroid redirection test, this kinetic impact demonstration mission lifting off on November the 23rd. Well, this week, on Monday the 26th of September 2022, the goal of intentionally slamming the tiny spacecraft into the smaller of two asteroids was finally achieved. I'll jump into that in a moment, but first a huge thank you to Squarespace today for supporting this video. Video. Do you remember when it took a team of designers, developers, and experts to get a simple site set up and running? Well, no more. It is so simple to get started these days using Squarespace with a bunch of great mobile responsive templates to match your brand. You could be building a portfolio site to showcase your work history, it could be a simple blog, or even an online store. In that case, Squarespace does all of the e commerce security and setup for you without the need for separate and sometimes expensive payment gateways. Ways, you will find all of the necessary tools that will let you get your site up and running super quickly. Once you are live, you can get wonderful insights into your site traffic, including where users are visiting from and how those users are interacting with your content. You can find out how many views you are getting, the time users spend on the site, overall audience location, and much more. To get your site started, you can open up a free trial, and you don't even need to enter credit card details to do it. If you want to check it out for yourself, just head to squarespace.com com slash Marcus House and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, here was Dart, and the speed on impact was on the order of 14,000 miles or 22,500 kilometers per hour. Dart's mass at impact was estimated at around 570 kilograms, that's 1,260 pounds or a little over half a ton. Now, it isn't exact because that mass included the fuel remaining. We then have the mass of Dimorphos, which is not exactly known either, but is speculated to be in the vicinity of 5 million tons or a lot of pounds. Yeah. That's about 11 billion. The goal here is to see what effect intentionally crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid has, helping to formulate a response to an asteroid impact threat. Yep, this is payback for the dinosaurs. True, in future we are going to need something a lot bigger than this to do anything significant, but we need to take this in steps. Now, the chance of a huge asteroid striking the Earth is slim, but it's not impossible. At some point, statistically, it's going to happen. At the end of 2021, it was estimated that only about 40% of asteroids bigger than 140 meters in diameter are actually known. With none of those known objects having potential to hit Earth in the next century, it is the other unknown 60% that has us as a species thinking seriously about how we would respond. So why Didymus and Dimorphos as the target for this test? Well, it is because it is an eclipsing binary system as we see from Earth. The small moonlet Dimorphos here has a diameter of around 160 meters or 525 feet, it orbits and passes in front and behind Didymos, which is about five times larger. Now, these bodies do not represent any threat to Earth, so it doesn't really matter what tests we do with them. What makes these the perfect test case to observe a high speed impact and its effects? Well, we know the exact orbital period of Dimorphos around Didymos is 11 hours and 55 minutes. With this information, we can now observe the orbit over a long period of time to see how it has changed after Dart's near head-on impact. What we should observe is a shortening of the time that it takes the small asteroid moonlet to orbit. Now, as you can imagine, timing was key to make this mission a success. The pair was closest to Earth this month and was about 11 million kilometers away at the time of impact. The final guidance sequence took place around four hours from impact and was done autonomously by the spacecraft using Draco, the Didymos Reconnaissance and Asteroid 
camera for optical navigation combined with the smart nav, the small body maneuvering autonomous real time navigation guidance system. Yes, thanks to whoever came up with those names. Anyway, all technology critical to the success of any future spacecraft design that needs to navigate to a target by itself. Interestingly, during its 10 month flight, Draco was tested by instead targeting Jupiter and its moon Europa as it emerged from behind the planet. A great way to fine tune systems before the big day. So yes, as we've seen repeatedly now, this is the final moments captured by Dart's camera. From another point of view, one of the Atlas telescopes was in a prime spot to watch this from Earth's surface. This set of frames is a time lapse of about two hours. The data sent from this and next missions to follow will hopefully form the beginning of a defense plan for the protection of all life on Earth. That is grand thinking right there. Now, just hours ago, of course, we witnessed Firefly Alpha's rocket making it to orbit successfully on their second attempt. Here we were once again during their fourth launch window, fully fueled and ready to go. Right at the start of the window, they lifted off, but sadly the stream was playing up just a little, so we didn't get to see the launch during the first few seconds. Never fear though, we sure did get it later on with a replay here. It seemed that all events happened as expected throughout the flight, including first stage engine cutoff, stage stage separation and second stage ignition. Just moments later we got visual confirmation of fairing separation too, and then right before the team lost telemetry, the second stage cut off as planned. Firefly then confirmed that the parking orbit insertion was achieved, and then these incredible views from the vehicle in orbit. Just check that out. Incredible news there for everybody involved. Huge congratulations to the entire team of Firefly for being the newest member of the Orbital Club, and thanks for having Tim there share it with us all. Okay, so the target date of the 27th for the first Artemis test flight of SLS and Orion came and then went early this week. Interestingly, NASA decided first to leave the huge orange beast at the pad instead of moving back to the VAB as the weather predictions became more dire. That kind of surprised me a little as they opted to keep an October the 2nd launch opportunity as a possibility. At the same time, of course, NASA continued making preparations for a more and more likely possible rollback to the vehicle assembly building. The big concern obviously was Tropical Storm Ian way out at sea at the time. As the modeling of the path it would take developed, it wasn't as obvious a decision for NASA as many may have thought. Waiting as long as they dared though, it was clear that they were now dealing with a hurricane headed their way. Staying put was no longer an option, and the SLS transporter rolled the beast back to be safely tucked away in the vehicle assembly building. It began the long slow trip back shortly after 11 p.m. local time Monday night, arriving at the entry door to High Bay 3 around 7.15am on Tuesday. Beautiful shots of the weather rolling in here at the time thanks to Greg Scott. I also think it's probably worth mentioning that late that night a fire was reported in the vehicle assembly building which included an evacuation process. Wait, what? Yep, luckily no reported injuries and the SLS was apparently not at risk. Well, that's a good thing. I can only imagine in my nightmares what the ignition of those two monsters monstrous solid rocket boosters would be within the colossal building. Anyway, the next launch date is yet to be confirmed, but it will certainly not be until November now. Hopefully we'll have some better luck on the next run. A quick recap of the Starlink 435 mission from last weekend. Yep, luck wasn't quite on my side again with the launch schedule there, with it having flown just after my episode went live. With a twilight 7.30pm local time liftoff with all running as planned, we saw yet another 52 Starlink satellites added to the broadband constellation. This was such a great time to fly rocketing out of the darkness into the bright sunlight. The noteworthy point here in this mission though was the pad turnaround time, an impressive record of 5 days and 23 hours since the previous launch from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. That broke the previous record of 7.5 days. Now just check out this ground shot by Spaceflight Now. You can see here the two fairing halves along with the first and second stages lit right up there. Always amazing to see this from the ground. The booster touched down safely landing on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas, and that is the fourth launch and landing for this booster, leaving SpaceX to deploy the Starlink satellites off camera. The network continues to rapidly grow, and interestingly I had this Starlink leaflet appear in my post box all the way over here in Tasmania promoting the service, so yes, they are really promoting this heavily.
Okay, so because last week's episode was just so packed, I totally ran out of time to talk about Rocket Lab's Investor Day and Neutron Development Update meeting. Rocket Lab says that they have already started manufacturing real hardware for their next gen launch system. Here is the new design, and it is definitely bigger. The first stage will be monstrous, powered by nine Archimedes engines. Neutron's fairings now are a little different too. It went from having four different deployment fairings to just two. These remain attached, of course, and open up and release the upper stage. Another major design change you can see are the legs. The older designs had these four static legs sticking out, and this new design has canards sticking out for more aerodynamic control. The second stage with a single Archimedes engine also got a bit bigger, and for the first time we actually got to see a full scale engine model. Some neat 3D work here by Clarence, creating some nice visual examples. Surprisingly, Rocket Lab also teased a render of their crew module, something that they are totally not announcing. Speaking of human rated upper stages, Ariane Group announced their proposal for a smart upper stage for innovative exploration, or SUSE for short. This is designed to fly with an Ariane 64 rocket or potentially other launch vehicles as well, and it is fully reusable, which also means it can land right back at a pad. Just look at these amazing visuals from the Ariane group here. There isn't a lot of information here, so I'm looking forward to see some more on this. If you want a deeper dive on the subject, check out my mate Shadow Zones video on it. A link to that is in the description. So that is about it for the week, with the exception of some great new James Webb Space Telescope awesomeness. I'll show those sweet images off in a second, but I hope your week has been a great one and that you are relaxing into a quiet weekend. Thanks so much, as always, for being here to support what I do here on the channel, along with the team working with me, especially to the many of you helping me here on Patreon or as YouTube members. Likewise, for anyone picking up some of the merch that I have here too. You can get this one fully stacked on all sorts of gear, light or dark. I'll leave you today with this great shot of Galaxy IC 5332 shared by ESA, taken by Hubble and Webb. First, the Hubble shot here in the ultraviolet and visible range. Well, just take a look at this, the same galaxy captured by Webb's MIRI instrument. How far away is this, you may ask? It sits around 29 million light years from us here and faces us almost perfectly to get this incredible perspective of these sweeping spiral arms. That is pretty darn cool, isn't it? All right, that about wraps it up. Remember, we have the big video dropping in one week, diving deep into artificial gravity options, structures and vehicles that can finally be practical with Starship's predicted low cost to orbit. If you would like to see other interesting topics such as this recent one on future propulsion, that one is here on the left, and other deeper dive videos here on the right. Thanks as always for watching all this way through. I'll catch you again for the next video.